Can I have your attention, please? Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, dear president and vice presidents of the EPFL, faculty members, media and company representatives, dear Thank students, you. welcome to the launch event of the 2018 EPFL Hyperloop team. My name is Jelena Malic, and I'm a master's student of computer science at EPFL, and I'm responsible for the media team of EPFL Loop. On behalf of our team, I would like to say that we are really glad that you decided to spend your Thursday evening with us uh, to listen to all the interesting speakers who are going to join us. We have a pretty dense agenda tonight, so I would like to say that it is our great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Vetterli, President of VPFL, and Professor at the School of Computer and Communication Sciences. We greatly appreciate the support he and EPFL presidency gave to our team that is allowing us to bring to life our pod dreams. Please join me to welcome Professor Martin Vetterli to our stage. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I was just earlier with a journalist um, giving, you know, these sort of talks I have to give. And uh, the journalist said, yeah, but what is EPFL really about? And uh, I said, you know, he said, oh, is it the ivory tower? How is it different? And so on. And I said, EPFL is different because of the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, this is not another university, it's not just some place uh, where the usual stuff happens, some exceptional things happen. And when I see this and the energy in the room and what has been achieved over the last few months, then I can see I was really speaking the truth, I was really feeling this uh, even before coming here. So I would like to thank actually in particular the team and their leaders uh, for the work that has been achieved on this extremely interesting project. Now, when I say this, I also have to say that in the front row is somebody I know, Marcel Juffer. Yes, Marcel Juffer. And, you know, when I read, I must say, uh, my son is a great fan of Elon Musk. Okay, can happen. Uh, you know, I guess I failed, right? So he needs another, you know, uh, role model. And so, you know, uh, about a year ago or so, I go to, to Geneva to some event, and, you know, I'm being told, oh, there is this Hyperloop thing and so on. It's incredible, you know, magnetic levitation at uh, speed of sound and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, I have seen this before, right? So when I was a graduate student, okay, that's a long time ago, I'm sorry to say, but it puts things in historical perspective. I had a, a window in front of my office, and there was a test run of magnetic levitation, okay? And the test run was not here on this campus, it was on the old campus of EPFL, and it was a test run for something called Swiss Metro. And the inventor of Swiss Metro is Marcel Juffer, so he had seen it all. There was, a, there was going to be a test run between Geneva and Lausanne, underground, with uh, you know, reduced air pressure, magnetic levitation, and everything was there, right? And I was sort of amused, I shall say, that Elon Musk sort of sold us back the idea, right? You know, he had sent his marketing people to tell us, oh, this is incredible idea of doing, of doing magnetic levitation in a tube uh, and, and under low pressure. And so I, I would like actually to also to pay tribute to all the young, you know, kids, girls and guys uh, that do this. This is incredible. But I also want to pay tribute to Marcel Juffer, who had seen it all, what, 35 years ago or something like this. And that's the time. There was no Elon Musk. I think that's what we are missing in Switzerland, okay? Because Marcel Juffer was preaching in the desert, right? Because the Swiss train company or whatever, CFF, you know, sort of said, what is this crazy idea, magnetic levitation, you know, another tunnel, blah, blah, blah. They never bought into the system as far as I'm concerned. And so a lot of very good work was going on, but there was no crazy American entrepreneur, right? And that is also my message, is that we need more crazy Swiss entrepreneurs. 
Okay. Okay, with this, sorry, that was sort of totally improvised simply because I saw Marcel Schuffer. And uh, when you make sure that we remember, you know, that actually great technology comes <coughs> typically out of great research and great people that have great ideas, putting it all together, it gives a sort of project that you guys are running. Okay, so here comes to, you know, the set, set of slides, okay. And so this morning, of course, I was looking at this fifth mode of transportation. I was thinking, yeah, that's the right day. I was stuck in a train because there was, you know, there was heavy snow. So probably, you know, with this mode of transportation, rainy day, shiny day, snowy day, no problem. You will travel at the speed of sound. Very good. Okay, so here we have the comparisons. You all know this. Uh, this is, you know, what creates global warming. Uh, this is what helps us, you know, reduce global warming. It's uh, quite a bit of an improvement. This guy contributes to global warming. You also know this. Uh, it's actually a, a subject of concern to us all. Uh, you know, sometimes people forget that traveling from Geneva to New York on an airplane full in a, in a coach seat is the same thing as taking an individual car and driving across the Atlantic. Okay, most citizens of this country and the world actually have no idea that this is the carbon footprint of air travel. Okay, and so here we are talking about something that could be the best of all worlds, right? It would be something that would be going faster than airplanes and because of the efficiency and because it's electrically powered, because it uses potentially magnetic levitation and so on, it will also be with much smaller carbon footprints at uh, the speed uh, that airplanes achieve actually produce today. Okay, so this is a great idea. Obviously, it has a few challenges, okay? And the challenges is that, um, and that's, you know, where the rubber hits the road is that uh, there are not only the car challenge and the air challenge, there is a transportation challenge, there is a mobility in general challenge, uh, you know, lived for a long time in New York, so this looks not like a crowded place to me, uh, but you know, that's what we are also going to live with. And so within this very complex environment of modern mobility, the challenge of sustainability, projects like Hyperloop have really a role to play. Will it be a reality? We will see, right? If it's a great idea, if the technology is right, if the funding will be there, it will become a reality and it will potentially change the way it will be done. So I guess this is a new version of the uh, train station in Renault, right? They are working on this as we speak. Uh, this morning it didn't quite look like this, I must admit. Um, and uh, I, I guess it will take Somebody help me with this, what, five minutes to go to Geneva? Uh, yes. Or something like this. Um, it has a very cool design, and as far as I'm concerned, I'll, I'll be happy to actually use it whenever it shows up. What I find very interesting in the sort of projects like the Hyperloop Challenge project you guys are running is that it's the archetypal interdisciplinary project. I had earlier today, I'm sorry to be in the anecdote mode, I had a, another a discussion actually with Jacques Dubochet, a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and we were talking about interdisciplinary research. And I said, you know, interdisciplinary research, it really requires people from different domains to have a third domain question, a new question to work on. So it's not, you know, you know, you do this, you do that, and you know, we each, you know, stay in our corners. It's really finding a new challenge to solve, which neither of the two can solve alone. And here we have a challenge where I'm very pleased to see we have practically the entire campus, representatives of the entire campus, you know, working together to actually solve the challenge. This I find also extremely exciting. That's why school projects are at EPFL are so exciting. And with this, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving support to the team. And we'll be watching very carefully how things evolve over time. Thank you very much. We would like to officially thank you for your commitment. And as a little sign of gratitude, we have prepared you a gift. So you can know we consider you one of the most important mentors and a member of our team. So. Ah, very nice.
<laughs> Merci Thank beaucoup. You. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, it is our honor to introduce Professor Marcel Jouffer, honorary professor of EPFL, the man who envisioned the ideas that are only now gaining the attention of the general public with respect to the Hyperloop concept. He is going to illustrate the history of Swiss Metro, so please welcome Professor Jouffer. Uh, let me say I'm very happy this evening. What I miss the most being a retired professor is to don't have any more contact with students. So today and with this project I am happy to have new students. I should probably have chosen another title uh, for this presentation, not only Swiss Metro, but also Back to the Future. What is Swiss Metro? It's a network uh, connecting the different mine cities in Switzerland. Uh, in a large city, the traffic for transportation, for people transportation, is relatively difficult because of the streets, which are narrow, the traffic for, for cars and so on, and the solution is to go underground. Switzerland is a big city, eight, eight, eight million of inhabitants, but it's more important, it has a big size. So if we create a metro, it must be relatively fast. I would say the reason for which we didn't choose the speed of sound to connect Geneva to Lausanne is uh, because it's almost impossible because we need a relatively important distance to accelerate. So uh, the idea to optimize the energy at this time is to connect all these cities uh, with a distance between 50 and uh, 120 kilometers with a more or less constant time of 10 minutes to 12 minutes. Tunnels, two tunnels of small diameter under vacuum. Why uh, tunnels? It's normal for a metro. But the main reason is the fact that in Switzerland nothing is flat. Uh, the density of habitation of cities on the plateau, Swiss, is so, so high that it's relatively difficult to create uh, any new line. Uh, expropriation, the, the problems which are created by noise, by, by the, the view, if you have uh, pillars with a tube, as an example, is such as it's better to go underground. But a tunnel is expensive, except if it is small. So the reason for which uh, we introduce vacuum is uh, for two reasons. The first one, uh, to be not too expensive with a tunnel or with a double tunnel is to have small diameters. If you have small diameters, you have a system like a, a piston uh, which has to push the air, so the best solution is to do like with a plane. What is the reason for which every plane, even going from Geneva to Zurich, has to go at the altitude of uh, 9,000 to 12,000 uh, meters is just because the energy you save uh, by friction at high altitude is more important than the energy you need to, uh, to use to climb up and to go down. So the idea was we have just to create the same uh, behavior or the same pressure that we have at, uh, let's say, 12,000 uh, meters of altitude. And obviously, it's easy to calculate this energy we need to use to create uh, the vacuum is a 
some percent, between five and six percent of the, of the energy saved by low pressure. Next uh, quality, magnetic levitation and guidance without wear. It's very important because we are in vacuum. We cannot uh, do uh, maintenance every evening or every two weeks uh, going in the tunnel. So the solution is to have uh, magnetic levitation. Uh, what we did, uh, we did, never created a complete Swiss Metro, but we tested uh, different systems. Uh, on the left hand, you have a guidance system with two tons, possibility to create a force, lateral force of two tons. Uh, a piece uh, in between is missing, but uh, we had the possibility to, so, uh, to, to test the reactions, the control, and everything. Uh, with uh, such systems. On the right hand, you have a, a wheel. The, the big problem we have always with linear systems is that uh, when we are testing, if the speed is high, you need to have uh, uh, very long, long tracks. And the, the reason for which we use the wheel, this wheel corresponds to fixed element in the tunnel, and under, we don't see it well. Under, we have a levitation uh, electromagnet, and with a force uh, of about two uh, tons, and we tested it at 400 kilometers per hour. This is important to do such tests because we have uh, some eddy current in the structure, uh, and we can uh, verify the modelization and the reduction of this effect. Uh, if we have to, uh, no wheels, we cannot use a rotating motor, so uh, necessary to create a, a linear motor. What you see uh, on the right hand, uh, you, what you will see on the right hand, uh, excuse me, this one, just here, it's a test track. Uh, Martin Vetterli was talking about uh, before, uh, on which we tested uh, linear motors, guidance system, and so on, with speeds not so high. It was only uh, 80 kilometers per hour, but it's uh, important to don't go faster with a track of 84 meters length. Uh, this, this track was uh, moved in, in a lab here, uh, 20 years ago, but no, it disappeared. I don't know why and how. But we had the possibility to test uh, such elements at uh, full speed or high speed or high acceleration. A similar system, a little larger, was presented by Hyperloop uh, two years ago. Uh, if we want to s just summarize what is Swiss Metro, we could just use this picture. It's like a plane, a plane without wings. Uh, we have just the, the cabin. This cabin is an aeronautic structure, and it is in vacuum or low pressure, uh, like a plane at a higher altitude. So why was it not built? The main reason was, first, the opposition of the CFF. And second, uh, priority was given to the basis tunnel uh, under the Gotthard. So, for this reason, it was not realized. A uh, request for a test track has been done, but never accepted by the Swiss government. Strangely, is my reason because I received this report, internal report, only uh, three months ago. The main reason, they said, this vehicle is not well calculated because it is not, uh, uh, the weight is too low. They didn't understand, we didn't build a railway or a train, but a plane. Okay, we hope it will change. For this, we need you. Now, from Swiss Metro to EPF Loop, it's a common element uh, adventure. 
and to realize something original. Uh, when I was a professor in the 90s, we created two big uh, projects with 80 stu students on Swiss Metro. Organized more or less like you are organized, but with few money. And it was a success. And what you are doing will be a success. No, we need something from you. Said to have another arrow in the other direction, so we could restart the Swiss Metro project in Switzerland. There are some movements around Zurich, we have some hope. And there are also some movements in Europe of interest for the Swiss Metro project. I wish you a full success. Thank you. If you can also wait a second. <laughs> As a token of our gratitude and to thank you for taking your time to talk to all, uh, all of us today and having made available the Swiss Metro technical literature, we have prepared you a gift as well. <laughs> so you can also know that we consider you one of the important mentors of our team and a member of our team. Here's a t-shirt for you. Now, let's give a huge round of applause to our next speaker, our principal advisor, Professor Mario Paolone from EPFL, who has supported our team from the very beginning, and he will introduce you to the story behind the EPFL Hyperloop project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iana, for the, for the kind introduction. I will have no slides, but... Probably, okay. Uh, I will say some words about the story which is behind the, uh, the team that is this night here. Uh, actually, everything was starting during the retreat that each year we do with the, the faculty members of the NFL. Have you heard about it? Because you are still very young. It's called Jonas Amitya Pedagogy. And actually, during this meeting was in August, uh, we had some discussion with the uh, which is the section director of electrical engineering, and uh, John Watsis, which is professor in mechanical engineering, and some others, because we heard that few students were interested to make a team, but the idea of what this team should do was very unclear. So they were thinking about doing a formal student team, so they were thinking about something that they use. Okay. So we come back and say, we have to do something for these guys. And then uh, there was a that uh, it will be next speaker that eventually, merci, that eventually became the um, the uh, the team leader of the FFL uh, loop that uh, came to me and said, uh, you know, there is this competition uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, are you interested to make a team? And then I say, you know, there is this group of students that is interested to make something, and I don't know how internally in all the channels that students have, the team was formed almost in a couple of days. So we are talking about uh, the speed of sound or faster than the speed of sound, this exercise was even faster. So actually by the mid of September, we already had the team entirely formed and up and running. The problem was that we were late. And the problem was that since the time we decided to compete, uh, we were late because actually we had no design. We had no idea of how the pod should look like, uh, uh, which were the subcomponents, nothing. And when we did uh, our first meeting, uh, you can see, you can recognize myself, Professor Jouffer, and the face of this gentleman, which is Dennis Tudor, that was looking like, hmm, <laughs> I don't know what is going to happen. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Anyhow, um, What's happened next? So we approached the, the project in a top-down fashion. So essentially we tried to formulate an optimization problem to define uh, the general performance and parameters of the pod. From this uh, first design, uh, we decided the subcomponents in a very coarse way, and then we submitted the project to, to SpaceX. 
This was around uh, November, right? So we participated together with several thousands of teams. And uh, with much of uh, our surprise, we were selected in few tens of teams. And you can only imagine the excitation that this triggered uh, in, in all the team. And then there was the next stage. And the next stage was, OK, now we have a very nice uh, design concept. We wanted to make it uh, more detailed. And then we spent uh, the month of December and part of January to essentially make a detailed uh, design of all the components of the pod. So you cannot imagine the amount of hours that these guys that spent night and day to prepare this document that was eventually submitted to the SpaceX engineers uh, by the 15th of January. And uh, we sent it. And then there were some people that were constantly on the F5 button of their you know, email account to <laughs> look for the reply. So the reply eventually came by the end of, uh, right, Dennis? I guess it was uh, yeah, the constant frequency of one hertz pushing on the F5 button. <laughs> I would say, what are you doing? I'm busy. Sorry. I'm <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, so the reply came by the end of January, and we were in the top 20 finalists. And, uh, well, this was uh, just fantastic for the whole team. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. So here we are building the pod. Uh, and this phase is very delicate be because actually all the ideas that these guys that put together, now they have to come to life. So we had to contact all the industrial partners uh, that can manufacture uh, some, of, some of the components. Uh, they have to remanufacture several times because you know, the, the, there is a design feedback. And we are in a very delicate phase where all the pieces have to, to be put together. Unfortunately, I cannot reveal the performance of the pod and none of its characteristics. But what I can tell you is that I have been surprised very positively by two characteristics of these guys. The first is the commitment. It's incredible the amount of time they spend on this project. I was really amazed to see them working till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning on defining a, a sub pieces to save some uh, 100 grams of weight on the structure of the pod. And the second thing, it's the capacity that they have to think out of the box. And I really much agree with uh, Martin Vetterli. This school is capable to generate engineers, researchers, and people like all of you that are thinking out of the box. The creativity that has been put in this pod is something that surprised me day and day after that, that we were building this pod. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised to see the technical competence and the creativity of the people that uh, decided to join this team. I don't know what is going to be the, the results of this exercise because the competition is very tight. What I can tell you is that we as supervisors and the older team crew members will do all they can to make this pod to run as fast as it can. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting us know about the early life of our team. Now, I would like to present to you the student who gathered us all here with his own creative and daring idea, Denis Tudor. Denis only started his studies at EPFL last semester, but this, this hasn't stopped him from creating the EPFL Loop team, which is one of the two new teams accepted into the final round of the Hyperloop 2018 competition. Yesterday, he started his PhD studies, where he will hopefully get more opportunities to bring the Hyperloop concept of transportation to life. His leadership skills have been holding our team together, even when times got hard and the deadlines were close. So he is the best person to tell you more about the challenges we faced during the past several months and the way our team was created. Welcome, Dennis.
thanks for uh, introduction, uh, introducing me. Uh, thank you, Professor Martin Vetterli, for coming for uh, our presentation. It is a big pleasure for us. Thank you, our supervisors, and thank you for our sponsors that can make it possible. So, coming at EPFL as master student, I didn't think to lead this amazing team. I'm literally honored and glad to work with the top researchers in the world. I'm going to recall again the Hyperloop infrastructure. So uh, I want to define this infrastructure to be as fast as a plane, as convenient as a train. This infrastructure implies two big parts. As you can see, there is a tube uh, with low pressure atmosphere plus a high speed pod. In order to develop this project, we need to take care about all the details that this pod requires. So, people are asking, why would you need a Hyperloop infrastructure, actually? So, this answer is very simple, actually. There are several advantages that you can see on the slides, but let's think we have the maximum speed of this mode of transportation as being 1,200 kilometers per hour. Given a distance of 600 kilometers, then you can travel in 30 minutes between two important big cities in the world. Now, let's think what we can do in 25 minutes in Lausanne. We are students at EPFL, and we want, after our program, that is very late, to go home. And let's suppose our home is in Lausanne, Flon. But in the same time, with 25 minutes, with this mode of transportation, you can go from Paris to Geneva. What can we do with five minutes? There is a coffee break. No. You can go between Lausanne and Bern. In 2013, Elon Musk relaunched this concept, and he proposed, as you can see, a pod with a compressor that uses air-bearing levitation plus cold air thruster for propulsion. And after that, in order to improve the future of transportation and to decentralize these innovations that appear and they are taken by all the entrepreneurs, he launched a competition in 2015 where teams can participate. This competition was held actually uh, the first phase of the first competition was in 2015 in College Station, Texas, where 100 teams came there. Then, the most important part of the project, in six months, he managed to build a vacuum tube that is one mile long with 8 millibar pressure atmosphere, where the teams can test their pods. So now, we are going to participate in the next competition. The rules are very simple. Highest speed will win. Anyway, without crashing, but highest speed will win. For that, the most important part for the project is the team. I want to congratulate my team for the amount of work that they spent for this project. We, all of us, are, vol are volunteers for this project. In the same time, I want to thank for all the advisors that we have, Mario Paolone, Dražen Dužić, 
and Andre Hoder, I'm literally glad to work with you. This is our external pod, and as you can imagine, we cannot disclose any detail from our pod, but instead of that, I can show you the shape of the pod that we'll have. <laughs> this will be the shape of the pod. We have many challenges for this, to create this pod. And one of the elements that we try to take care and we actually give a lot of attention, attention is the autopilot of the pod. So, every of us knows how Tesla is working. So, as you can see in this image, it can detect every object and locate them surrounding us. But our, our, our autopilot is better than that. We don't use any GPS. We can approximate the position, the speed, and the acceleration is in, inside the vacuum tube. This image was done by 6th of February, when Falcon Heavy launched a Tesla. But who of you ask yourself, is it a real Tesla or is it just a case? What differentiates our pod than a Tesla car? It's more efficient, more powerful. It actually can resist for low pressure atmosphere. So, I'm literally honored to restart this project in Lausanne, in EPFL, and I want to thank you for my team and for my advisor. I hope seeing you for the next, next event that will be for unveiling the pod. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, there is a slight change since Lorenzo Benedetti, our mechanical ninja, could not be with us tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Nicola Riva, the leader of our aerodynamic team, who will tell us more about the mechanical design challenges that our team encountered. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Yeah, um, unluckily, uh, Lorenzo Benedetti had a commitment, and I want, first of all, to thank him uh, for the help he gave me uh, in order to, pre uh, to prepare this presentation. Then, um, I want for sure to thank again all the um, professors and advisors that are here for us, and uh, I want to thank you <coughs> for, for assisting to our project. So, um, this evening, I will talk about uh, the main challenge that our team uh, is facing, in, uh, namely in two, um, in two teams that are aerodynamics and mechanical. So, um, the, the, first, uh, the first challenge I want to talk about is aerodynamic for sure. So, most of you may argue, well, but you are in vacuum, which, which kind of uh, challenges are you facing off? Um, the, which kind of viscous forces do you have if you are at about one hundredth of the um, atmospheric pressure at sea level? Well, for sure, we don't have so much uh, drag, uh, so, uh, drastic or huge uh, uh, viscous forces. But uh, we have another problem which uh, comes from a, a property of the air that you can experience as every day, which is the compressibility. So uh, most of you probably have uh, played when uh, we were a child or when, with an empty syringe trying to squeeze the air out of the syringe or maybe pumping the air um, uh, in a bicycle pump into the tear of the bicycle. So what is going there is, and if you did that, um, you have certainly experienced some resistance of air from, um, from the piston that is pushing the air. That, that is because the, the piston um, is pushing the air and does not allow to the flow to the air to go around the piston. 
And uh, if you think to Hyperloop, it's exactly this. We are pushing a piston through, uh, through a tube, but at 1,200 kilometers per hour, as Dennis showed. So the thing here is that we, are, we have a, um, a mode of transportation, which is our pod, which has a cross section, which is really comparable to the sides of the tube. So what does in, what's going there is that the air is compressed uh, so much that the flow of the air will choke around the pod and will, if you want, will uh, make arise some losses in terms of speed to our pod. And this is the challenge for modern aerodynamic team. So we don't, maybe we don't need a really fancy design for uh, the viscous, uh, viscous forcers, but we need a fancy design uh, because it exists um, a geometric relation between the cross section of the pod and the cross section of the tube, which is called Kantrovitz limit. If we stay above these limits, we will have problem. If we will stay below these limits, then we can, um, we, we will be fine. But it's so it's also a trade off between uh, the sides of the pod. We can say what we do a, a real large, uh, real large tube in order to not have this kind of problem. But then a, a large tube will be a problem in terms of cost. It's not really attractive uh, uh, in terms of, of in terms of uh, selling. So on the other side, the pod has to um, to host enough enough people or uh, or to be enough comfortable to the people. So uh, it's it's a matter of trade off. Uh, this takes me to the next slide, which is the comfort. I'm not speaking about comfort in terms of how nice is the chair where you are going to lay down during your trip, but I'm speaking about uh, comfort in terms of eventual vibrations or, uh, exp or ex uh, acceleration experiences that the, our customer will use, will um, experience. So um, just to give you an idea, if you took a European short flight, um, a European short slave uh, um, has the lift off from the from ground at 200, 200, 600, uh, 200, 600, oh, 260 kilometers per hour, and uh, um, this acceleration occurs in about 25 seconds. So, to simplify our life, uh, the acceleration is about three meter per second square, and even if some of you can feel uncomfortable in uh, during this acceleration we can think to apply the same acceleration to Hyperloop. If you want to reach 1,200 kilometers per hour with the same acceleration, the time, uh, that, will, the time that will, uh, it will be about uh, two minutes. So to reply to, the Mart to Martin Vettel's uh, question, yes, from uh, Geneva to Lausanne is about five minutes, if you want. Because the length uh, that uh, Hyperloop will cover with this speed and with the acceleration is 20 kilometers, okay? In, in two minutes. If you think to the maglev, it's a Japanese technology uh, based on superconducting technologies, that it goes at uh, 600 kilometers per hour at the top speed, and it will cover the same amount of space, let's say 18 kilometers. So you can face um, which are the challenges in terms of vibrations, acceleration, that uh, we, have to, we have to take care. Um, for sure, let's say, we accelerated. We everyone, everybody is fine. We are uh, we have the uh, cruise speed, which is uh, 1,000 uh, uh, 1, 200 kilometers per hour. Then a failure occurs because it can be. So we have to go back to the most safe state of the pod, which is namely the steady one. But now we are we are at 1,200 kilometers per hour. So. If you think to a, to a train and to the um, uh, incredible kinetic energy that is bringing this train, um, in, in, in that case, the conventional breakers for, for, for the train will, will clamp the rail and will heat up and will tr transform the kinetic energy into heat one, if you want, heating up uh, the brakes and the rail also. So we, in that case, we have to uh, well, uh, design really well uh, the... Um, the brakes in order to withstand a really huge temperatures, okay? But once you have designed really well the, the brakes, you have to remember that the pod is manned. There are people, so you can't brake too fast because you can't push on people 5Gs. So it's a trade-off also in these kinds. So the last part, it's, if you want, is that again, we are in vacuum. 
So uh, if you, we like airplanes today, so we say we took an airplane at 10 kilometers of height because that's the normal uh, height of, the, um, of travel if you want. The pressure right there is about one fourth of the pressure at sea level. So this means that if we have a leakage in the airplane, um, the unconsciousness state can occur between 30 seconds and one minute. That's why the hostess tell you put the mask off and breathe air in case of. So we have to think that in Hyperloop, uh, we have a much worse problem because we have a one hundredth of the atmospheric pressure. So the hypoxia uh, problems can be can be more uh, more can affect more our customers. So. Um, we have to think also to um, supply our customers with fresh airs in case of, of a leakage. And this actually is a, th those are, as you can see, there are really a lot of challenges that occur among an incredible amount of uh, uh, fields and competences. And go going back to what um, Vetterli and Paulin were saying, APFL is an incredible place where to gather the, the teams and uh, to also, if you want, to mix up competences and teams. In the engineering mechanical team, there are not only mechanical engineers, there are um, uh, there are several uh, fields like material engineers and electrical and the physicist and, uh, and civil engineers. So, um, it's really, I, I'm really glad to be in this project and really, really glad to Dennis to involve me in this. Because just to let you know, I'm the, I'm the aerodynamic leader, but my field and background is superconductors and I'm a physicist. So it's really, really far away from this. But I think it's a good, uh, it depicts quite well what's going on in, this, in, this, uh, in these teams. That uh, again, I want to thank sir. And, uh, and I think that uh, now it's, it's, it's the time of uh, my next colleague that will talk. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Now, it's the time to introdu introduce you to our levitation and propulsion team leader, Théophane Dimier, who is a master's student in electrical engineering at EPFL. He will let you know about all of the energy handling, levitation, and propulsion challenges the team has faced. So, as you've been told, we face many challenges and hopefully we get some solutions. Basically, everything started with an optimization problem as we have been told at the beginning of this presentation. But once you have the solution of your optimization problem, you need to implement that solution. And here we get to our job as a propulsion and levitation team because we have several constraints based on that optimization problem. We have to respect them, otherwise our work is completely useless. And something that are interesting is that we could think, okay, we are in power uh, domain, so our constraint will be only on power. But we also need to integrate our system in a pod, a physical pod, with mechanical constraints. Um, so we need to work with mechanical engineers because they will tell us, okay, you can put it here or not. Uh, you can transfer your power in that way or not, mechanically speaking. So that's the first point that's really important. Moreover, we need a control of our system. Otherwise, it's just a missile or a rocket. <laughs> and basically, as uh, Dennis told, we are not allowed to crash at the end of the tube. So basically, we need to control. So we need to work with the control team, with their autopilot, because it's nice to have a beautiful autopilot, but if the power system does not respond, unfortunately, it's less, and it will be our fault. So we have the first main challenge of integrating, of integrating our design of our subsystems into the entire pod. Then another thing that comes in mind when we have to design such systems is maximize the power density. We hear those days quite often the terms energy density with electrical vehicles, long-range electrical vehicles. Energy density is a measurement of 
how much energy you can fit within a certain volume or a certain mass of storage. For the power, it's something similar. Power is basically the rate of conversion of energy from one form of energy, basically our storage, can be anything you want, to something else, another form of energy. In case of a transportation mode, transportation product, basically it's kinetic energy, the energy that's related to speed. And if you want something that goes fast, you need to give to that thing a lot of speed, a lot of kinetic energy. So you need to do that as fast as is possible to accelerate as fast as possible. So you need to have a huge conversion ratio between your input energy and your output energy. That's the power. <laughs> then, we know also from uh, a British gentleman that uh, discovered a few centuries ago, uh, he's called Isaac Newton, maybe you've heard of him, um, that acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So another key point to accelerate is basically to reduce the mass. Because as you may know, for two cars that will have uh, engines of the same power, probably the one who is the lightest will accelerate faster than the other one. So that's another key point. And basically, while linking power and mass, you end up with power density. How much power can I get from my system for a given mass. So our job as propulsion and levitation team, but also for the energy team that uh, I uh, congratulate for their amazing job, is to reduce the mass for and extract more power of the system. And it's always like that, that you can achieve uh, world-class records for your system. So basically, look towards power density to win the competition. Finally, we have another problem with vacuum. Because as you maybe know or not, not all components can withstand vacuum. Uh, for example, usually uh, living uh, objects such as humans or animals uh, cannot withstand vacuum. But also some components cannot withstand. So we have to think about that. Another key point is the heating, because all systems have losses. Even the best propulsion system that you can imagine will always have losses. Losses are basically just heat. When you are driving your car or riding a train or something like that, there are losses in the propulsion system. But you have air around your vehicle, so you can just transfer that excess heat to the air, and that's all. But just think a minute, when you are in the high pole tube or such system, you don't have ambient air to cool down your system. And uh, the main problem we have in that case is that we don't want the passengers to be cooked. <laughs> or maybe if you're transporting uh, fresh fish, you want sushi at the end. If it's cooked, it's over. Uh, yes, I'm French, I like food, I'm sorry. Um, basically, so we have to think about those problems. It's always an iterative problem, because once we have the solution, we need to see if we can integrate it. But it may be the integration will decrease our power density. So we will need to find another way to do it. But maybe we'll start to think, okay, but is my system vacuum-proof or not? And like that, we do an iterative process. And uh, thanks to my colleagues uh, and to our advisors, we have in mind how to do that now. Because work is quite a useful tool when it's the, the goal is to reach high speeds. So the key point is always think, how can I accelerate my port? I maximize my port density. But I have some constraints of design all around. I would like also to um, thank our sponsors for their amazing support. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and uh, all the presidency, uh, all the people that have helped us, all the 
school for their support and thanks for being here tonight. I think we can applause you because uh, it's a beautiful adventure and basically all the, we feel that all the school is with, uh, with us in that project and all the country even is uh, with us in that project and that's really something beautiful. Also, I would like to thank uh, La Fondation pour les étudiants de l'EPFL, who is giving us uh, an amazing support. It's really something um, really pleasant to have such uh, sponsors behind us. I also like to thank uh, National Instruments, Comsol, Lemo, Rosas, and uh, Le Clancher for their both technical and all the things support. And that's really amazing. I would like to applaud them because our sponsors are really good. And that's really uh, a nice thing. So, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Telfan. Now, it's time to present you the most important part of our project our team members and our advisors, who have been working hard for over six months to make this project happen. Dear team, please stand up and join me on stage. Thank you. Now that we are all here, it's time for your questions. If you want to ask something, please raise your hand and someone will bring you the microphone. Uh, so I have checked up. I've checked out the website and I haven't seen the like uh, open positions or like open. Uh, well, do you need people to join you? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, of course we need more people in this project, but we should have keep in mind uh, the amount of time that you should spend. With, in this project is not a piece of cake so if you want to be in the project you really have to think about that but yes we accept people so EPFL Facebook page as well our Facebook page showed and posted uh, the position, uh, positions of, uh, available actually last week we posted uh, we need avionics engineers in the team so uh, the contact, the main contact is posted on uh, our social media, so you can join us, you can send an email, and you can, we can get in touch. Thank you. Next question. Can you reveal the maximum speed you've reached? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We cannot disclose this in this moment. It's a competition you have to understand. Okay. I'll have to blackmail you. <laughs> okay. Next question. Okay. Uh, so actually I've read that uh, you plan to uh, build a Hyperloop facility in Switzerland. So my question is, like, does it mean that we will have a test track for pods at EPFL or somewhere else, maybe in Switzerland? Uh, we'll start with a test track in our lab. Uh, next month, we'll start to build the, the track, so it will be uh, 10 meters long. But after the competition, we will not stop here, so we try to build uh, like a longer tube, a longer facility to test the pod. But it, it will be at EPFL or? Yeah, we something? plan to do it at EPFL. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There was someone over there with questions. There. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, are you already planning for the after competition? Um, all the technologies uh, you are developing and you don't want to reveal. And does uh, SpaceX has an access to the intellectual property, to the technologies you are developing for the competition? The whole intellectual property is at EPFL, but they can use some parts that we develop. And we participating at this competition, uh, honestly, we have to give, we don't give them the right interaction property, but they can use some parts of our project. Uh, we actually, we want to continue this project all after the competition. And as I said, we want, we want to do a facility uh, in campus here, and then why not in, uh, in the routes that we proposed between Paris, Geneva, Lausanne, Bern, and Zurich. So, um, a new startup? Uh, let's wait. Uh, <laughs> we cannot disclose all the plans. Thank you. More questions? There are two in, in front rows here. Sorry. Hello. Um, do you have an idea about the budget you will need to, to construct this and also, I mean, over the overall picture, how much, will it, uh, how much will it cost to build this here, for example, in Switzerland? We cannot disclose <laughs> uh, the small scale port, but our full scale uh, cost is similar with what Elon proposed on his Hyperloop Alpha uh, paper. Which is? Uh, it's, it's a public information. It's one million three hundred uh, uh, dollars, actually. Okay. Next question is there. Yeah. Uh, hi. I see there are like 40 people. I mean, you worked a lot, but uh, who, who, how did you organize yourself? What, what okay, so let me present you. <laughs> so I will start with mechanical leads. Uh, where are you? Nicolas and uh, Marta, so those two guys are the mechanical leads. <laughs> then I will go with Nicolo, that is our aerodynamic lead. <laughs> Theophan Dimier, that is our levitation and propulsion lead. Okay. Okay, sure. Nemanja Stojowski, that is our software lead that makes the telecommunication happen. Gabriel Namtsu, that is our control lead. Did I miss someone else? Antoine, oh, sorry Antoine. Antoine Copin, that is our uh, energy lead. Our principal advisor is Professor Mario Paolone. <laughs> Professor Drazen Dujic. <laughs> and Professor Andre Hoder, uh, sorry, PhD Andre Hoder. <laughs> <laughs> These are the leads of the, of the teams. So, in principle, here are the main members of the team, and uh, if you want to have a look over the, all, the all the members, you can check our website, they are presented on our website. Uh, it, well, thank you, this is important always to point out to all leaders, but uh, my question is, were you just pure enthusiasm, or did you use some special organizing methodology to put all of these things in a, such a short time? I mean, because you worked a lot during December and January, because there are many companies out there who have a lot of resources and are not able to deliver so, such an interesting uh, product or, or, or a prototype in a such a short time. So is it just enthusiasm, or what's your secret... Uh, management uh, <laughs> as recipe. I, as I told you, EPFL is with us and they totally and fully support us in everything that we develop here. I mean, starting from laboratories or desk or, desk or uh, 
places to give students to stay, to the workshops uh, that are in the site. So they fully support us on this project, and this is one of the key for our project. Uh, yes, and all the team members do this because of the passion. They don't consider this like a work. There is no 6 p.m. for them, so yes. Thank you. So I want again to congratulate my team. Okay, we have maybe time for one more question. Is there anyone willing? Over there. Thank you. Um, have your decisions been uh, driven solely by the transport of passengers, or did you also give some thought to uh, transporting cargo, for example? Because that could be an interesting area economically, you know, to consider. So, yesterday we had this discussion at the lunch time. So, <laughs> we'll go first to test the cargo, and then if all the pressure conditions and all the vacuum, uh, I don't know, the technology will permit to use this for person, for sure we'll go for this solution. But yes, first you will go with cargo and then we'll go uh, trying to carry people from uh, the most important cities in Europe to Switzerland. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately the time for questions is now over, but if you still want to have more insight, you can join us after the closing of the event on this stage. Now, I would like to ask all of the speakers and Zofia and Antoine to join us on stage so we can make one team picture together. I would like to... Wouldn't be nice if it worked. <laughs> I'm only one in red. I'm a... uh, uh, uh. Close, 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 close. <laughs> Let me just go, 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 go in front of Benny. That's nice, no? Uh, thanks for... Uh, do you have That's it? Okay. Thank you all for coming to our EPFL Loop launch event. We hope our speakers have been able to explain you how we are developing the fifth mode of transportation and help you in realizing the importance of this project. We hope that we will meet again to tell you about all of the new challenges the final round of co competition has brought us. Stay tuned on our social media and on behalf of the whole EPFL Loop team, I wish you a pleasant evening. <laughs>